Let's talk about balanced forces, that is, talking about systems that are in equilibrium. Uh, that means that there are no net forces uh, acting on an object or on that system. Now, there might be forces there, but there is no overall or no resultant or no net force. Now, if that's the case, then that means that uh, an object's motion is unchanged, so that means there's no acceleration, and it has a constant momentum and constant velocity. If you want to change the object's velocity or momentum, then you have to apply a force, a resultant force in a certain direction. That's what I've dealt with in the other video on Newton's second law, that is F equals MA. But here we're gonna talk about forces in equilibrium. Please make sure that before watching this video, you have seen my easy vectors trick video, which makes uh, resolving vectors a lot, lot easier because life is too short to draw millions and millions of triangles. Providing that you've seen that, let's crack on with forces in equilibrium. So let's say that I have uh, an object. Let's just say that it's a ball like so. There are two forces being applied to this. There's one going downwards and one going to the right like that. And uh, this one here is going to be five Newtons this one here is going to be 10 newtons. Now, if these were the only forces acting on this ball, then of course it would accelerate in this direction, wouldn't it? What if I asked you, where would uh, a third force have to be applied in order to make sure that this ball doesn't accelerate in that direction? Hopefully, you tell me that it would have to be off in this direction here. I'm gonna call that F. How do you know that? Well, because it should be directly opposite the resultant force due to these two forces right here. It's gonna be there. In order for this ball to be in equilibrium and not accelerate, then these two forces have to be balanced. So I could ask you, find the resultant force due to these two forces, or I could ask you, please find the force that would need to be applied in order to keep this in equi equilibrium. In either case, you're finding the same force just in opposite directions. So I can find F just by doing Pythagoras. F equals the square root of five squared plus 10 squared. And that gives me 11.2 Newtons. All I found out is the resultant force due to these two forces that are at right angles to each other. And I know that this also has to be the same magnitude force, just in the opposite direction to that resultant force due to those two forces in order for it to balance. This system is now in equilibrium. There's no resultant force. What if, however, we have another ball, another object, doesn't matter what it is, and we have one force pulling down here with 20 newtons, and then we have another force pulling up in this direction, better complete it there, and that's acting at an angle of 35 degrees to the vertical, and that's actually gonna be 15 newtons. In order to find out what the third force I would have to apply to keep this system in equilibrium, where that is and how big it is, I need to find the resultant force due to these two forces first. But the problem is, is that they're not at right angles to each other. But I do ultimately need to find two vectors, two forces that are perpendicular to each other, at right angles to each other in order to find that out. So what do I have to do? I have to resolve this 15 Newtons into vertical and horizontal components. So if I was to draw them on here, they look something like that should probably be a little bit taller there. So I need to resolve this 50 Newtons into vertical and horizontal components. Now, we could draw a right angle triangle and then uh, faff around with Sokotoa, but we're going to use my quick and easy trick instead. Let's find out what the vertical component of this 50 Newtons is first. We know both of these are gonna be smaller than 50 Newtons because we're going from a resultant to a component. So that means we're going to be timesing by cos or sine of 35. Don't forget to watch my video if you have no idea what I'm talking about, the easy vectors trick. So I'm gonna be timesing by cos or sine because they're between zero and one. Um, but am I going to be using 
cos or sine. So I know it's going to be 15 times cos or sine 35, and this is going to be the same, but which one is which? Uh, the easy vectors trick says turn away from your sine, turn away from your sin. That means that if you turn away from the angle, you use sine. We turned away from the 35 degrees to get from the resultant to the component. And if you want to uh, go from the resultant through the angle to your component, the resultant to the component, then we're going to use cos. Now you can use your triangles to do that if you want, but uh, if you use this trick that's in my other video, it does save you a heck of a lot of time. So let's find out those numbers. This is 12.3 newtons. This one here is 8.6 newtons. Now that I've resolved this 15 newtons into vertical and horizontal components, I can actually forget about it. These two perfectly represent that 50 newtons that were there, but a lot more handily because they are vertical and horizontal. So now I have just vectors that are horizontal and vertical. These are all at right angles to each other. This should then get turned into just two vectors that are at right angles to each other. That should look like this. Horizontally, we only have this 8.6 newtons here, that one there. And vertically, we had 20 pulling downwards, but we had 12.3 pulling upwards. So this should be equals to 20, take away 12.3 because they're pulling in opposite directions. And that gives me 7.7 .7 newtons. So yay, now I have two vectors that are right angles to each other. All I have to do is find out the resultant due to those. Let's call this F. And again, that's gonna be equals to the square root of 8.6 squared. 7.7 squared and that gives me 11.5 newtons. So where would I have to apply a third force in order to keep this system in equilibrium? Just the same as this but in the opposite direction so it's going to be here and it's going to be 11.5 newtons exactly the same. So there you have it when you have a system with lots of forces pointing off in all sorts of different directions all you have to do is resolve to find the vertical and horizontal components of all of them. We didn't have to resolve this 20 newtons because it was already vertical, so there's no horizontal component to it at all. And find the resultant of all those components. And then obviously we have one going in the opposite direction to balance everything out. What about if we have some sort of mass hanging in the air, being held up, being suspended by two cables. Now the force that's keeping this mass up is obviously the tension in the cables. I'm going to call those T1 and T2. What are those tensions balancing out? Well they're balancing out the force due to gravity, that is the weight of the mass, and that's going to be mg. That's what weight is, mass times g acceleration due to gravity or gravitational field strength. And I can tell you that these tensions are at the angles theta one and theta two to the horizontal. I could give you the vertical, but I've given you the angles to the horizontal instead. Now then, it doesn't really look like we know a lot from this situation. All we know is that it is in equilibrium. This whole system is in equilibrium. This mass is not accelerating up or down or left or right. So what do we know? We know that the vertical forces are balanced and also we know that horizontal forces are balanced as well. So we can actually do some figuring out of what's going on here then. We know that both T1 and T2 have a vertical component. Uh, let's just draw them on here. I'm not really drawing them to scale, but uh, you get the idea. There's the vertical component to T1 and the vertical component to T2. I have no idea what size they're going to be. Now, can I figure out how big these are going to be? Yes, because I know that they're components, so they're going to be smaller. So I'm going to take T1 and times by the cos or sine of theta1. Um, and this one's going to be T2 times cos or sine of theta2. Uh, but what is it going to be cos or sine? Uh, see if you can figure that out real quick. Tick tock, tick tock. 
we're going from the resultant to the component, but we're turning away from the angle. So we're going to be using sine. Like so. So we have mg pulling downwards, and we have t1 sine theta 1 and t2 sine theta 2 pulling upwards. We know that if they're balanced, they have to be equals to each other. That is t1 sine theta 1 plus t2 sine theta 2 equals m g. I've just come up with an equation and I'm going to put a one next to that because I know that's going to come in handy a little bit later on. So that's all I know about what's going on vertically, but I also know that the horizontal components are going to be equals to each other as well because it's not accelerating left or right. What is this going to be here? Well, this is going to be nothing to do with mg because it doesn't actually uh, factor in. There's no horizontal component to it at all. But so this is going to be t1 cos theta 1 because I'm turning it through the angle. And this one here is going to be t2 cos theta 2. Again, because I'm turning through this angle here. What do I know? They are equals to each other. t1 cos theta 1 equals t2 cos theta 2. I'm going to put a 2 next to that because I now have my second equation. What are you going to have to do here? You probably guessed it. You now have simultaneous equations and you're going to have to substitute uh, something into one of the other ones in order to find out anything. Which one are you going to substitute into the other one? Generally, I would choose this one to sub into your number one here because uh, it is a little bit simpler. So I'd go T1 equals T2 cos theta 2 over cos theta 1. And you're going to pop that into there. What you'll inevitably find is that you end up with an absolutely beastie equation uh, that really gets messy very, very fast. But just keep your wits about you and you will be able to do it. So I have t2 cos theta 2 over cos theta 1, because that was what I substituted in. Then I have to times that by sine theta 1, plus t2 sine theta 2 equals mg. What I have to do then is factorize for t2, and I end up with cos theta 2 sine theta 1 over cos theta 1. I wonder if you have spotted a shortcut yet. Plus sine theta 2, brackets all of that, equals mg. Now there is a, a little bit of shortcut here because generally you will find yourself with the sine of an angle over the cos of an angle as well. Uh, you might know that that is actually tan of the same angle. Just a wee shortcut that will help save you a couple of seconds if nothing else. Then all you have to do is uh, divide mg by all of this mess here and you end up with your tension 2. And then you can pop that back into here and then whoops, find out what t1 is. Tell you what, I'm going to actually do uh, an example for you with some numbers so you can see how you do this. So let's say that we have a gymnast and they are standing on a sort of tight ropey thing like that and uh, they're just they're, they're just sort of balancing there like so lovely so the mass of this person and the mass of this gymnast is 90 kilograms quite a heavy guy <laughs> so that means that the weight pulling downwards is going to be 90 g because all we have to do to find weight is times kilograms by g that's not 90 grams that's just 90 times g that's times 9.8 he's on these two wires the tension in the two bits of the cable, T1 and T2, we don't know those. We're going to find those out. The angles that they make are 40 degrees to the horizontal and 30 degrees to the horizontal, respectively. So let's go with vertical first. So there are my components again. So this is going to be T1 sine 40 times because I'm making it smaller and 40 because I'm turning away from there. And this one here is going to be T2 sine 30. I know they have to be equals to 
that 90G there. So we have here T1 sine 40 plus T2 sine 30 equals 90 times G. That's actually equals to 882 Newtons. So I have my first equation right there. And I know this is going to be T1 cos 40 going through the angle. So I use cos T2 cos 30. And I know they have to be equals to each other. So T1 cos 40 plus T2 cos 30. Whoopsie. So I want to rearrange this. So I have T1 equals T2 cos 30 over cos 40. Just taking cos 40 to the other side. I'm going to pop this back into here. And I'm going to end up with an absolutely beastie equation that looks something like this. Sine 40 over cos 40 cancels to, well, that is tan 40 plus T2 sine 30 equals 882. Factorize that. Now, generally, at this point, what I do is actually find out what this number here is. So it makes it a little bit easier to deal with. 1.2, so that's T2 times 1.23 equals 8.82. Therefore, T2 is going to be 8.82 divided by 1.23, and that gives me 719 newtons. So there you go, I found out what T2 is. All I have to do then is pop that back into this equation to figure out what T1 is. Already rearranged. So that's going to be T1 equals 790 times cos 30 divided by cos 40. And that gives me 813 newtons. So there you go. That's how you can uh, resolve forces to find out uh, how big these forces are in order for a system to be in equilibrium. As per usual, being able to deal with any sort of new situations is paramount. So practice, practice, practice. That is key. So if you think you're happy with balanced forces, have a look at my Newton's second law video, which goes on to what happens when a system isn't in equilibrium, when there is a resultant force which leads to acceleration.